Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The opportunities and risks associated with the transition to renewable energy in South Africa have been showcased this week. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss how stakeholders are seeking to navigate these. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. There is growing acceptance that renewables will be playing a bigger role in South Africa's power and energy sector. Yes, that's correct. I think around the world you can see that the energy transition is really gaining momentum. And in South Africa too, we've had some major developments with the ministerial determination, which is a large renewable energy component, finally having been concurred with by the regulator. And we should see the gazetting of that document soon. And uh, there's the indication that we'll get into bid, bid windows again or procurement rounds again in j latest January next year. And also around the world, you know, we see this big clamor for carbon neutrality with China, the latest making a commitment, a line in the sand to becoming carbon neutral by 2060. That's a major development. You see Europe is talking about 2050 becoming carbon neutral. And there's going to be more and more carbon neutrality plans. And the only way to really transition to those carbon neutral plans uh, and in societies is through a massive upscaling of renewable energy. And in those hard to decarbonize sectors that you can't electrify either, use renewable energy probably to produce other energy carriers such as hydrogen, which can be used in mobility and industrial processes. There is concern that some industries and people might be left behind. That's correct. You know, South Africa is a coal dominant country. We've built our whole economy around coal over many decades. We've got about 92,000 people working directly in that industry. And as we decarbonize, that's going to mean that we're going to need to close our coal mines and some of our coal-fired power stations. Obviously, this is a multi-decade transition. It's not an overnight event, but there's a definite transition away from coal. Even the oil major BP has announced that it's no longer wanting to be an international oil company, it wants to be an integrated energy company. It's going to be scaling up renewable energy in a big way. And uh, in South Africa, we're having a transition away from coal where about 11,000 megawatts of coal will be decommissioned from now until 2030. Some of that is already naturally being decommissioned through the poor maintenance. And that's why we have these, this load shedding. But uh, it's a lot of coal that's gonna be coming off the system and there's gonna be a replacement uh, using renewable energy technologies. And we're going to see that, you know, about 10% of our system is going to be solar, uh, about uh, close to 20% of our system is going to be wind by 2030, and coal is going to play a less prominent role. And therefore, those communities that are built around coal-fired power stations and coal mining, both domestic coal and export coal, are vulnerable. So there's this threat of ghost towns, there's a threat of large-scale disruption to employment in certain sectors. And uh, it is a risk uh, to social stability, and it is a risk to the transition, because while we know that solar and wind is now the cheapest form of new electricity, you know, there will be resistance unless people can see that their livelihoods are, are not negatively affected. What are some of these solutions being debated? Well, the, the solutions are many manifold and they're complex. So you've got solutions like increasing the levels of local content in rolling out wind and solar farms. That's obviously going to take time and that really requires policy certainty unless there's a consistent procurement and sticking to what we say, uh, we won't see the investment around uh, ele electricity production, especially components in that go into wind and solar farms. Uh, being developed in South Africa. So that's really a, a, a box that needs to be ticked by government. Can it consistently stick to its word on energy policy? If it does, I think we will see high levels of local content. But the big jobs in renewables is really in the construction side of things. So we need to maintain a consistent procurement and deployment of renewable energy. And if we have the consistency that we see uh, suggested mostly in the Integrated Resource Plan of 2019. So wind around 1.6 gigawatts a year and solar 1 gigawatt a year, uh, although there is a gap uh, for two years in the solar deployment. 
But if we see that consistency, we will have consistent renewable energy jobs in construction at a higher level than we see in uh, coal currently. So coal, as I said, around 92,000 people. In wind alone, we're looking at direct jobs in construction of over 160,000 jobs. So the, the good news is that there is more jobs in this transition. And uh, there are also a number of other benefits that can come. The issue is, do we have the policy? Do we have a vision? And that vision now has to extend beyond electricity to the energy sector as a whole, because to extract the full benefits of this transition, we're going to have at times too much capacity during midday, for instance, when all the solar plants are running and maybe there's a lot of wind. So we need to find a way to not just curtail and just waste that energy, but to convert that into green hydrogen. We're gonna be saving a lot of water uh, as we decommission our coal-fired power stations. Those are very uh, big water guzzlers. And we can convert some of that water using electro electrolyzers into green hydrogen. And that will help us decarbonize uh, sectors that are, would be more difficult to decarbonize using electricity directly. So we know passenger vehicles, we can uh, electrify through electric vehicles, but big trucks, factories, uh, trains, they're going to, and ships are going to need different uh, alternatives as, as will aeroplanes. It's not easy to electrify an aeroplane, uh, especially an a intercontinental airliner. So we, hydrogen is the key there to helping to decarbonize. And South Africa really is in a sweet spot because we've got this formidable uh, uh, sun and uh, wind resource, and we can combine that with our availability of land to be very competitive in producing green hydrogen. But it's all going to come down to having that vision, having policy certainty, and to sticking to what we say we're going to do. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.